Hi, everybody. Today we have Beth with us. And I know Beth because I hired her. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're still in touch with your vendor manager, it means that it didn't go uh, terribly wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> so if you could just talk a little bit about yourself, Beth, and uh, you know a bit of your background, where you're from, and all that stuff. And then we'll just have a little bit of a chat. Absolutely. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Beth. I am a PhD researcher in Brussels, and I am also a conference interpreter. I work with English, French, and Spanish, and my main specialization is inclusive language. So that's in your PhD, right? Or, or even in your professional... I, I guess you could say both. Um, mm -hmm. It's my uh, the focus of my research, but it is also something that I definitely actively try to to use in my professional life as well, mm -hmm. and of course, personal life. Yeah. <laughs> so when did it all start? So I mean, I tried to look like I told you. I tried to look at your LinkedIn profile, and I was like, "Whoa, so many things, so many things." I don't know where to start. So I decided not to have any specific questions because I'll I'll just let you go through it. <laughs> yes, so I studied interpreting and translation as my undergraduate degree. I graduated from that in 2019. Mm. But even way before then, I always knew I wanted to be an interpreter. Um, I visited Strasbourg when I was a child and we walked past the European Parliament and seeing all of the flags and as someone who's quite politically engaged, mm -hmm. The, the idea suddenly came to me and I thought, well, one day I could do what the people in the EU Parliament do. Um, I, can, I can use my passion for languages um, alongside my passion for uh, talking. <laughs> <laughs> That's important. Um, and from that point on, it really became my, my goal to become an interpreter. So uh, I went to university, studied interpreting and translation. Um, my my passion for interpreting did not at all dwindle during that time. Uh, if anything, I became even more determined, thanks to the to the support uh, from uh, from my interpreting uh, tutors. And after that, I decided to go and live in the south of Spain for a year, hmm. teaching languages. Um, that was a wonderful experience. Perfect after four years of hard work, uh, enjoying the Andalusian sunshine. Uh, really practicing my Spanish, eating lots mm -hmm. of good food. It was it was a good time. Uh, I then, uh, in the middle of the pandemic, went back to Scotland uh, where I did a master's degree. Because you didn't say that you were Scottish, but everybody has already oh. been thinking about your accent, I'm sure. Yes, of course, <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm, I'm Scottish. I studied in Edinburgh from near Glasgow originally. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I went back to Scotland um where i did a master's in interpreting absolutely loved it it was there where i first started researching inclusive language mm -hmm. because honestly i sort of became interested by by osmosis because my other half mm -hmm. has been very passionate about inclusive language particularly inclusive language in french for for several years um, and so if she'd be reading books or um, doing research, I would sort of pick up the papers, pick up the books, flick through them uh, and realise, oh, this is this is pretty interesting. It's pretty important. <laughs> um, and so I decided that I would focus my research for my master's dissertation mm -hmm. on inclusive language in French and Spanish mm -hmm. in conference interpreting. Oh, wow. I see. <laughs> um, yes. And so that's sort of how I I came to, to that aspect of my career. Mm -hmm. After I graduated from my master's in 2021, um, I worked as a freelance for a while, um, doing some interpreting, doing some translation as well. I've had the opportunity to do some fantastic gigs. Mm -hmm. um, highlights were probably film festivals um, that was fantastic uh, particularly at the, the Catalan Film Festival in Glasgow 
I had the chance to interpret for an incredibly um, inspirational black trans woman from Brazil. Uh, yeah, she was living in Brazil, but um, was a native Spanish speaker. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, for Greenpeace, for other environmental organizations, NGOs. Uh, and in February 2022, I moved to Brussels. Mm. And I absolutely love living here. It's the perfect place to be for linguists. Uh, so many wonderful opportunities. Um, my partner is working as a translator at the Council mm. of the EU. Okay. So basically, <laughs> it all job. comes together. <laughs> yes. And I, I started my PhD scholarship last October. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's a bit about me. I basically in the space of a couple of years have managed to pick up lots of wonderful um opportunities um some really fantastic gigs um i've lived in some fantastic places uh and now i'm basically doing uh doing living my dream the life thing, living <laughs> living my dream life getting to research something i'm i'm super passionate about mm. living my best linguistic life uh surrounded by so many languages yeah uh, yeah, yeah, life's, <laughs> life's good. <laughs> okay, that's great. But I want to take you back to some technical technical tease because I'm thinking that uh, you're the first interpreter that I'm actually talking to on the podcast. So that's impressive. Mm -hmm. And I, I always, I know a few interpreters, obviously. I've even done some gigs myself. Let's not talk about those. But <laughs> it's such a hard job. So I'm, I'm just wondering when you first came in contact with what, what really entails to be an interpreter? I mean, when you were probably still back in, in college, how did that feel when you when you had to learn so many specific things that basically only apply to that and you cannot live uh, without, like, you know, all the, the, the boots and the dealing with microphones and uh, dealing with that, that kind of software that I have no idea of and you know that kind of thing i know that there's a i had a friend a polish friend he's a very good interpreter and he used to show us a little bit of his type of specific writing that you have i think just to, yeah. to make uh notes super quick and all of that so how was it when you when you were like yeah i want to be an interpreter but you probably i mean as you were super young you didn't even know the ins and outs of of the job mm -hmm. right so how was it the first impact when you realized it was such a, a technically challenging job <laughs> sure i mean uh, you basically got it in a nutshell like it, it was my absolute dream i knew where i wanted to be i knew what the job was but it was a bit of a re reality check for me when the first time <laughs> I, I really vividly remember the first time that I sat in, in a booth because my university has fantastic facilities. They have their own interpreting booths that are modelled on oh, those that's at, fancy. The, at the EU Parliament and the UN. And yeah, I remember sat, sitting in there and the first time that I, uh, that I had to do simultaneous interpreting, thinking, oh no, have I made a mistake? Um, because as you say, it's extremely technical. There is so much going on in your mind um, all at once, because it's not just the understanding the language, it's also making sure that the, the language that you're producing is clear, um, that it makes sense, that it's, that it's concise, that you're not confusing anyone, while also um, managing the the sound quality the 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 headsets all of that sort of stuff uh, the note taking although the note taking is more particular to consecutive interpreting mm -hmm. um consecutive interpreting is where someone will give a speech you'll take the notes as they're talking once they're finished you'll stand up you'll recite the same speech mm -hmm. in a different language so in my case english um and I think if you speak to a lot of interpreters, they will tend to have a preference for simultaneous interpreting. I'm one of the few who actually really enjoys consecutive. I uh, really enjoy the note taking. Um, I enjoy standing up and pretending to be someone else for a while. To me, it's a little like acting. Um, 
I'm not as nervous when I pretend to be somebody else. I don't know if uh, if other interpreters feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, so as I say, when I first started, huge, um, huge reality check, throwing it at the deep end, giving it a go. But um, yeah, you, I definitely had a few moments of, oh, I don't know if this is right for me because <laughs> my whole life I've been such a, a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. Like if I don't get something straight away, I'm probably not going to do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, w when you felt yeah. that way, were you like, oh my God, what am I going to do? But did you actually do well when you first started with your first, you know, let's say testing phases, right? At uni. Um, I mean, yeah, uh, I I get very nervous in exam settings. So mm -hmm. I would always kick myself after exams thinking that I definitely didn't do as good as I could have. Um, and definitely that was a repeated pattern <laughs> throughout my courses. But um, it definitely all changed for me when I had my first like real life gigs. Because once you realize that you are there not for people to judge you but to help people right like that's your job is mm -hmm. if you weren't there they wouldn't be able to understand that's true so you're you're there as a tool to facilitate communication mm -hmm. and once you get that into your head the whole process becomes so much easier well for me anyway so it might seem a bit of uh, an oxymoron but definitely when I first started working it was so much less stressful to interpret. Mm -hmm. So what was that first gig without being too specific, if you can't, because I'm sure, you know, there's always those uh, questions. But I mean, just in general, what kind of gig was it? So the first time that I ever tried real life interpreting was at my university organizes every year um, a really brilliant event. It's a multilingual debate and they invite people from the local community. They invite local schools and um, basically they have a panel of people, they have a topic and they are all invited to debate this topic. Mm -hmm. And they give final year undergraduate students and master's students the opportunity to interpret. That's all, pretty much all of us who do that course, that's our first real experience of something that we're not graded for. It's just to show us what it's like to be an interpreter. So that was the first time for me um, actually interpreting for an audience who were very much relying on me. Mm -hmm. The first time I I was so stressed, so nervous, like the pressure <laughs> is, is enormous. Um, but yeah, after, after you've done that a few times, mm -hmm. you get more used to being scared I guess you could say like it's, mm -hmm. the, it's yeah. the adrenaline rush you, you <laughs> learn to, to deal with that uh, uh -huh. more than with your skills right yeah I guess. instead of using the adrenaline like instead of panicking from that sense of oh no people are relying on me what do I do I need to be perfect you sort of learn to just sort of sit back and let that adrenaline just mm -hmm. take you forward and continue mm. to uh, to interpret um, but that was still in a in a pretty well-known environment what about even more real life when money was involved. <laughs> um, so not with money being involved, but I started volunteering mm. um, shortly after I'd completed my master's degree. Um, and um, yeah, that again, being a first, so bearing in mind as well, this was during the pandemic. Everything mm. was online. I had to totally... Ah change my way of working you mm -hmm. no longer so when you're doing simultaneous interpreting you always have a booth partner or you should mm -hmm. always have a booth partner yes yes <laughs> um, if it's something you know well done well prepared <laughs> yes yeah of course and having to learn how to work with your booth partner with them being not in the same place as you and um, at the time um there were trying to use softwares like like Zoom. Uh, they had interpreting functions, but they weren't, you could tell they weren't designed by interpreters um, because there was no function to work with your booth partner. Mm -hmm. So um, that first real life assignment I had, I had to have 
um, one computer where I, that I was connected to mm -hmm. to do the interpreting. I had to have another computer uh -huh. uh, so that I could listen to, um, to other interpreters. And then I had to have a, um, another device, like my phone or something, or a tablet, so that I could communicate with my, with my booth partner. And so, yeah, that was like the experience of interpreting for the very first time. Doing that in real life for the very first time <laughs> is uh, it, it's sort of, yeah, it's a real challenge for, for the mind for, um, for interpreting. Mm -hmm. But um, you you did um, didn't I hire you for something that was in in person and that was a conference? Wasn't that what the company hired you for? No, <laughs> I've, I've never uh, I've never done any um, in person. Um, ah, so it wasn't like that already. Assignment for yeah, I the only in person assignments that I've done since completing my masters mm -hmm. um, have been the the film festivals that I referenced before. Um, so yes, uh, that first, that first assignment where I was actually interpreting for other people uh, and another thing as well was because it was an international organization, there were people speaking in accents that I wasn't very familiar with at all. Were you working from Spanish or? <laughs> uh, the very first assignment I was working from, from and into English, French. Mm -hmm. and um it was an event talking about environmental issues in different african countries mm -hmm. and um the speakers that i was interpreting for it were from democratic republic of congo and burkina faso uh, and yes i had tried as best as i could to prepare listening to um listening to clips on on youtube right uh, but it was incredibly stressful i think mm. my my uh, my poor booth partner who i was working with had to deal with um with some with some panicking with some tears with them having to suddenly take over because i uh, i literally couldn't carry on with the with what i was saying sometimes but i think i think a lot of interpreters probably have similar for sure, <laughs> because it's such a stressful kind of thing. So do you prefer to do it, like I already, you said just before, from and into, so I'll try to keep that, uh, Spanish or French? Um, interesting question, because before I would have said Spanish, because uh, <laughs> after living in Spain, right. my Spanish was um, was pretty, pretty good. Uh, I was very confident. Um, but because now I live in Brussels, I'm using mm. French every day. Um, mm. My university is a French-speaking university. Uh, my research is into French language. So now um, I have French as a B language, which means it's a language that I work into when I'm interpreting. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel much more confident with French than Spanish. How okay. However, I, I, still, I still work from Spanish and I still absolutely love it. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess it will have to do yeah. with your circumstances in life when you when you have two you know uh, languages like that, so that you go through phases depending on what's going on in yeah. your existence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's what's um, funny in our relationship with languages too, right? Because mm -hmm. our real life has such an impact in our uh, work life because it's true that we have at certain moments in our lives a more. Uh, a closer relationship to one language than the other. So that is something I totally understand. Yeah. So, but can you, I, before we even get into your research, just, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if everybody knows the different types of um, interpreting that exist, because you already mentioned consecutive, which means that you, uh, the person speaks, right? And then you take your notes and then you mm -hmm. speak, you like you, you, like you are the other person and then you speak mm -hmm. as if you were the other person. And yeah. then you have... Um, simultaneous right mm -hmm. which means that it's like they're speaking they one sentence they stop no they never stop right they keep on going and you just have to <laughs> somehow yes. <laughs> yeah absolutely so um simultaneous interpreting is probably the one that people are most familiar with i would say 
Mm -hmm. I think it's what people think of when you tell them that you're an interpreter. Mm -hmm. Um, the the sort of interpreting you see people sitting in the booths um, at international institutions like the EU, like the UN, um, the person, the speaker uh, is talking and at the same time we are in the booth with our, with our headsets on, with our microphones and we simultaneously, I say in inverted commas, um, yes. <laughs> because it's impossible to be saying something at exactly the same time as somebody else, if that makes sense. There's always a tiny little bit of a, a of a gap. Mm-hmm. Uh, and interpreting this is what we call décalage. Mm-hmm. It's the it's the gap that you allow yourself um, between what the speaker is saying and you interpreting. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but essentially that's it. The person speaks, we speak at the same time. Uh, Mm-hmm. in a different language. Mm-hmm. So keeping the, the French terminology, I, I know of, because I've done it, my favorite part <laughs> of the whole interpreting, it's a little bit less stressful, I would say. And it's, uh, I guess it's it's probably easier if if you need to do it under certain circumstances. So there is the chuchotage, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, Shishotage is probably the one that I'm least familiar with out of the different uh, different modes. Uh, that involves uh, somebody speaking and you sit beside someone who requires your interpreting and whisper <laughs> what is being said to them. Uh, but I have never actually uh, done this in real life and it didn't feature very heavily in my training. So... Uh, <laughs> I don't want to speak too much about that because uh, mm. I don't want to. No, I understand. It's just that it's very circumstantial. It's like mm-hmm. if, if everybody else in the room speaks a certain language and only one person yeah. doesn't speak the language, right? So that's very particular. Mm-hmm. That happened to me when I was working in research and we had a bit of a, a meeting. It wasn't a conference, right? So it mm-hmm. was a meeting. And there was only one person who couldn't speak uh, Portuguese. So I had to do it because of that. And mm-hmm. that was a lot of fun. I like doing yeah. it. And also my, my experience with interpreting was actually... Uh, painful experience because <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to do and it was a pretty uh, uh, high level situation that I didn't know I was uh, getting into. I, I already posted about that so I, I someone hired me to go and interpret at, a, at, a, at a, an event and then in the end it was the best soccer player of all time Pele and I had to be on stage with him. Wow. That, uh, that. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> that is just the the scariest probably event of my existence because yeah the, there were 2000 2500 people in the uh, venue itself and then it was being streamed live and it was a, a big event and I had no idea I only found out a few days before <laughs> and I'll tell you, it's it was very very hard situation, but yeah, it happened, absolutely. and we all survived. And then I spent a whole week with Pele, which was absolutely amazing because then all he required was was more of a shoshotage situation again, and that was mm-hmm. totally fine because we had uh, interviews with uh, a lot of journalists from all over the world, and that was a lot of fun. So it was a big event in in Los Angeles. So that was my experience, and I was like, oh my god, I'll never ever do this again. And why me? Why me? So yeah, because it was a favor to a friend. And you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> and did you ever do it again? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. No, I don't <laughs> think I could because I'm too scared. <laughs> mm-hmm. I yeah. don't think so. But you never know. I mean, things just happen in such a way that if you had asked me back then, I would have said no too because I, they didn't tell me what it was at all. Mm-hmm. And it was like a friend, someone I had met in a certain circumstance. So yeah. I thought it was going to be fine. And in the end, it was just so scary because when they started wiring me. It was when I realized what was happening and I thought I was going to die right there. And I almost did. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think it really it really shows how interpreters can be used in so many different settings and how it's, um, yeah, th- there are all these different modes available. Um, for example, uh, there are liaison interpreters. So, for example, public service interpreters which is another completely different type of interpreting again. Mm-hmm. It's more That's on the phone, sort of, right? Um, it can be, mm-hmm. um, or it can be in person as well, mm-hmm. where you, I guess it's almost like a combination of different modes because it's a little bit like consecutive because you can take notes 
basically like many consecutive chunks. It's basically you sit in the middle between usually two parties, but it can be more. Um, they speak, you relay what has been said to the other person. They speak, you relay what has been said back to the original person. So that's a mode that's used commonly in settings like hospitals, mm -hmm. um, police stations, uh, courts as well. Um, yeah, so it just shows that interpreting is such a, a varied profession and that just because you do one type of interpreting doesn't necessarily mean that you do all kinds of interpreting. Right. <laughs> uh, for, for example, I, I consider myself a conference interpreter because certainly my experience and where I feel most comfortable with is in conference settings. Um, as I said, simultaneous and longer consecutive. Um, and I also think that you need to be very um, emotionally resilient. Sometimes to be a public service interpreter, you have to deal with many, many difficult, uh, difficult issues. Um, it's often used in settings where you're dealing with people who have gone through traumatic experiences and um, who are um, who are undergoing medical treatment. So yeah, I think for me, that would be probably the most challenging type of interpreting. Mm -hmm. I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> so throughout all of those adventures, then it was time or you thought it was a great idea to, to do your PhD. And how did you choose? Did you go to Brussels on purpose because of the PhD or... Was it for that or were you already there and just decided to do it over there? Or was there a particular program or how, how, did, hap how did it happen? Uh, so I moved here um, originally um, because my partner had been offered a, a fantastic opportunity hmm. um, at one of the EU institutions. So we sort of moved here. It was quite a last minute decision for me to also move here. I originally thought it was going to be for a few months. And we decided that we didn't want to leave. Uh, and so I decided that I wanted to find something more permanent here and being extremely passionate about, uh, about research. I happened to stumble across on LinkedIn of all places, uh, <laughs> an advert from, or a job posting from um, a university in Brussels looking for a PhD researcher um, and I decided to apply and I was extremely lucky and a few months later heard back from them that I'd been offered the position. Yeah. So did you, you already knew about the topic or was it a bit yes. up to you or? So I, it could be any topic to, uh, that falls under the umbrella of translation and interpreting mm. and I had had my idea already formed in my head um, and so um, I had to write a proposal outlining what I wanted to do um, and how I would conduct my research. Uh, so yes, I already had the idea uh, fully formed and uh, had to send, send that to them uh, for mm -hmm. them to decide whether they wanted to hire me or not. Yeah, so is it is it like you have classes for well i'm doing my phd too so that's <laughs> well mm -hmm. I'll, I'll my situation see uh, how close to yours is so we have classes for about two years or so and then we have another uh couple of years to develop uh, the the research itself is it like that or did, did you go straight to the research part or is it because you call it a job yeah. right and in my case yeah. it's definitely not a job it's i pay for it <laughs> Uh, no, I'm I'm very lucky. Uh, this is my my full time position now. Mm -hmm. uh, although I do still do some interpreting, but uh, it's pretty much research from the word go. So I started in October straight away into designing the research, um, starting to to read. Basically, my job I'm being paid to to research, which is. Mm -hmm amazing <laughs> i realize that i'm i'm extremely lucky to get to do this mm -hmm. um and yes we do we do have classes um but not on a uh on a regular for example weekly or daily basis it's mm -hmm. more they make trainings available to us and we can go uh and 
and learn about different research methods, um, GDPR, data storage, um, all of that good stuff. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So what is the, can you talk about it? I don't know if you can, the specific topic of your research, like specifically is, or do you have a title or? I don't want to go into specifics too much right. <laughs> uh, because I'm quite. Uh, early stages, right? Yeah, I'm in, I'm in the early stages and I don't want to give away too much, but uh, generally I am researching the use of um, French inclusive language by interpreters working from English into French, obviously. Mm -hmm. And by inclusive, we mean? By inclusive, um, no, <laughs> this, is, this isn't an easy uh, question I know. to answer. Without, <laughs> That's why uh, I asked. Without delving a little bit deeper. So. Go as deep way, as you want. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the way I define inclusive language, mm -hmm. as, as it says on the tin, it's language that doesn't exclude anybody. Um, so um, in essence, a uh, language that doesn't make doesn't make assumptions about people um and it doesn't uh yeah it doesn't exclude anyone based on on gender on sexuality and disability uh yes but when we look at languages that are um, are gendered languages. Mm -hmm. Latin languages, for example. That's why you yes, focus on example, French, right? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Um, it's a little bit more uh, complicated, shall mm -hmm. we say. Because <laughs> whereas, whereas in English, which is my native language, um, which is a, a natural gender language, incidentally, it means that we don't have um, as many grammatical rules that are dictated by gender. Mm hmm uh, in languages like French, like you said, like like Portuguese, like Spanish, they are highly gendered languages grammatically, mm -hmm. yep. which means you can't escape it. Nope. <laughs> and, <laughs> yes, uh, and in these in these countries, inclusive language has basically come to encapsulate the idea of using language that uh, that doesn't discriminate based on gender. Mm -hmm. So it's more um, of vocabulary and expressions and not so much focus on grammar, I would assume. Um, no, quite the contrary. Whereas in English, it focuses much more on things like vocabulary. Vocab oh my goodness, sorry. Vocabulary. Yes. Um, <laughs> for example, um, words that end in, in man, for example, postman, we might say mm -hmm. posty. Right. Fireman, we might say firefighter. Mm -hmm. In French, for example, the, the the inclusive language movement, shall we say, the idea of inclusive language. Yeah, well, of course, you will have to manipulate grammar. And this is where mm -hmm. the problem is. Yes, when I say exactly. that, you, maybe you don't focus, you, or it's much harder to focus on grammar. It's because everything else, even if it sounds a bit strange, you can go a little bit around it. But it's just that it's, I suppose, very complicated for the Latin language community speakers, communities speakers a lot of S's there, uh, to actually accept or incorporate because it's not natural to yes. manipulate grammar to that extent, right? I don't look at it as being a manipulation um, because I, I will speak mainly from the perspective of French of because that's where I, I focus my research. Um, French already has numerous ways to, to be more inclusive, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so, for example, for me, the, the penny dropped when I read a book by um, a writer and historian from France called Eliane Viennot. And she wrote a wonderful book. Um, and it, well, she's written a couple of fantastic books. Uh, the one that I read was called Non le masculin n'emporte pas sur le féminin. Um, and it really situates. French inclusive language within a historical context. And the penny really dropped for me when I read this book because as someone who learned French and who had to learn all of these grammar rules about um, that the, the, the masculine um, takes precedence over the feminine, et cetera, et cetera, I, I realized that that, that when I'd started learning this and I'd sort of asked my teachers about why why this was the case, it was always, oh, well, you know, it's just grammar. Uh, it's 
it's got nothing to do with um, with you know somebody's gender, with men, women, whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this book, as I said, really situates it in a historical context, and it describes how um, it's not an, an accident that these languages are so masculine centric that they have the generic masculine in French, for example, that many feminine forms of certain professions were taken out of the language as well, that Mm -hmm. it was actually quite a deliberate um, change that was was, uh, made to the language over time by people who were sort of in charge of gatekeeping the language, if you like, um, bodies such as the Académie Française, the French Academy, um, basically to reflect patriarchal values, to... Uh, to try and uh, ensure the status quo, um, men entering professions such as medicine, etc. And so I think once you fully grasp the idea that that language is this way for a reason, and because it it is a tool to reflect patriarchal values, it's hard to to come back from that. Mm -hmm. Um, And so as we know, um, rightly says, it's it's very easy to use inclusive language because there are tools that have have always existed. So the argument that it's it's unnatural or that it somehow ruins the language to try and use uh, use formulations that are more inclusive, you just need to go back in time. You need to to pick up a book and and look at and see. For example, let's take the um, the rule that. Um, when you're addressing a group of people, mm-hmm. if there's, say, 100 women. And one man. And one man, you use the masculine. Mm-hmm. You can, going back in time, you can find that there were other rules that were used, such as the uh, the proximity rule. That means, basically, so if you have a sentence, the the adjective at the that you use reflects the, the noun that's closest to it in a sentence. Mm-hmm. So if I give you an example, um, the the men and women are beautiful. Mm -hmm. In that sentence, because woman is closer to the adjective, the adjective agrees with the feminine form. Mm -hmm. If it was the other way around, the women and men are beautiful, then the adjective would refer to the masculine form, if that Mm -hmm. makes sense. Another rule could be um, the the majority rule, it's called. Mm -hmm. So um, the majority rule dictates that uh, in a room of, um, of say, um, five five men and two women, you would use masculine. But if it was switched the other way around and there were more women than men, then you would use the feminine form. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I don't see this as being a huge, uh, a huge manipulation because it's using tools that have already existed before in the past i i don't although i realize i'm talking about all of this from a from a more distance perspective mm-hmm. um as, than someone from uh from france or belgium switzerland etc would have because i don't have as much of a an emotional attachment to it. <laughs> that's true so <laughs> for me i can sit back i can look at the the findings of of researchers um who see that inclusive language is is important and it's necessary and here are the here's the data that shows that using language that that isn't inclusive that the the negative effects that it has but um i because as i say i don't have that emotional attachment i can look mm-hmm. objectively at this without feeling without feeling in any way threatened by it mm-hmm. I, I think if you're part of a community that predominantly speaks this language it's it's something totally different i think it's the um the the non-binary writer eris young who who writes in their book uh, they them there mm-hmm. that the the problem is that many people see language well not a problem but the the reality is that many people see society and, and language as being so totally intertwined Mm-hmm. A language reflects a community, a community reflects yep. a language. 
And so if you have people coming in and saying the way that you use your language is, I don't want to say wrong, but mm -hmm. you should change the way that you speak. Mm -hmm. Then what are your... Well, there are other about? alternatives. Now, there are other alternatives, then, then that can feel like not just a threat to language, but also to, to the community. Um, and so, yeah, I, I went off on a bit of a tangent. There, no, sure, sure. What I'm saying is, is that That's I great. totally, totally recognise that it's very easy for me to say, um, to say how important inclusive language is, particularly in such heavily gendered languages, while also mm -hmm. recognising that I can totally understand the, um, the objections. Mm -hmm. So the thing is that language will evolve a certain way and things will either get picked up or dropped <laughs> as sure. they always have been, right? Of course, mm -hmm. of course, there's always been parts of society that have power and they are able to do things a certain way. And it's been here for such a long time. And also the formation of all Latin languages were specifically mm -hmm. uh, happening at a particular time in our history as humanity, and which was pretty recent. We just feel like it was a long time ago but so it, there's a lot of potential for you know for evolution and for everything else that's going to come and i guess that's what it is time will tell what language will do with all this new information that it's actually probably recovered from more ancient times so yeah. let's go so you feel that uh, this will happen like but naturally it will Obviously, naturally, <laughs> it will happen a certain way. But do you think that people will have some action that they can, some actions that they can do to really make sure that positive changes occur? Absolutely. I mean, this is one of the the debates: um, is that shouldn't language just be left to to evolve naturally with the information that people have? Um, shouldn't the the attention be focused elsewhere, perhaps on getting um, people who aren't men more into the limelight, giving more opportunities, uh, quotas, etc. But um, there's another camp that says that no, we really need to try and do more to enforce inclusive language. Um, so basically, the, the the arguments fall into into four camps. Mm. Right, one that it's totally unnecessary. You have the people who say that um, you what what will language change? Language only reflects society's values. It reflects mm -hmm. society's opinions. Um, however, I think when you look at the research, that's that's not entirely entirely true. Um, there was a researcher now. Uh, let me think. Their name is Kristen Schutze. She describes it as being like the ch the climate change argument. Okay. <laughs> she says uh, you have all of this this data that's available, all of this uh, all of this research uh, that shows the negative impacts that um, that non inclusive language has. For example, the researcher Pascal Gigax. Um, has found that um, that it has a direct impact on the number of uh, of job opportunities that there are for for people who aren't men, for example. Hmm. Um, and so, all that to say, language can evolve naturally, but I think that with a little bit of a push, it could really we could really start to see real world impacts. Because because um, Pascal Gigax has, has already found in in research that when you do start to incorporate even something simple like instead of just using the masculine form, using the feminine form as well, that women are more represented. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so you mean in in job ads, for example? In yes, for example, uh, like for uh, in Belgium, um, mm -hmm. it's now. Uh, it's now mandatory for for um, job posts, for example, to include both the masculine and feminine forms, because they they consider that to be to be necessary. Mm -hmm. um, there are others who say that the attention should really be focused elsewhere. As I said, I I don't entirely disagree 
but I don't see attention as being a finite resource. Like, yes, okay, fine, attention should be focused on um, on combating combating sexism in other areas, providing more opportunities, um, but I don't see the two as being mutually exclusive. Mm-hmm. Um, others say it's very complicated. Again, I feel like this is an argument that doesn't really hold water. Uh, I think that it's very easy to to incorporate inclusive language just with a little bit of um, not awareness exactly, but just if you keep it in your head that the generic masculine can be exclusive. Mm-hmm. I think once you have that in your head, it's quite easy to avoid it. Um, I would recommend for, for French speakers to follow the um, Revolution Inclusive page on Instagram. They have many different uh, tips and tricks for being more, more inclusive without necessarily using, um, uh, for example, inclusive writing where you use a dot or a slash or an asterisk. Mm. Um, because I think that's what people often think about when they say that inclusive language is complicated. Mm. Um, but there are so many other ways that you can be inclusive just by simply using um, reformulations, um, by by using uh, epicen nouns, nouns that, that don't change based on, on gender, um, and using group nouns, for example, uh, staff instead of... Um, uh, instead of uh, naming the the profession, for example, saying saying staff instead of teacher or mm. um, yeah, uh, or um, school instead of pupils, for example. Um, I really like this proximity rule. I, th- yes. I, I think that's the one I'm going to start using just to see what happens. <laughs> I, I really enjoy the, it. That's the that's the thing is that we we everyone should recognize is that that language doesn't belong to any particular person. It belongs to all of us. So I can already like, imagine a man being uh, with a bunch of women, and then we saying. Uh, the, everything in 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 feminine because it, mm-hmm. it's only one of uh, him, one of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I, I guess that could be a really cool experiment. Mm-hmm. Do you conduct experiments within your research, or is it uh, or what what kind of experiments? Are they more linguistically inclined? Are they more social? Um, more social. As I say, I don't want to go too much into into details, um, because I'm still in the early stages, um. But yes, I am conducting conducting experiments. Um, my my research isn't focused on whether we should or should not use inclusive language. Mm, mm-hmm. My research is focused on the use of inclusive language, um, and interpreters' ability to use it, rather than whether we should or shouldn't. Mm-hmm. I don't think I'm the best person to to say whether people should or shouldn't use it. That's that's not my place. My my place is to or my, my idea is simply to see how prepared we are for mm. for in the future when when it is going to become more common for language practitioners to be asked to use inclusive language. It's becoming it's becoming more and more of a hot topic, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know how it is in the Portuguese speaking world, but certainly um, <laughs> in <laughs> in the francophone world uh, and in anglophone countries as well um and so so the question is uh not talking about your research because that's what it is and then you'll probably in a few years talk about it in the podcast who knows uh hope i'm still here so but how prepared do you think it's not you interpreters but the people who work in the language service community let's say that just <laughs> as open as possible how prepared are we to to like uh focus or deal with or introduce or use uh inclusive language i think it will take time i think that there are more and more resources being made available but i 
I don't believe that it comes particularly naturally to a lot of people yet. Um, so I think there needs to be a focus on, on, on getting getting resources out there um, and providing training. As I say, there are already so many fantastic um, practitioners in our field who who are making such uh, such training and awareness raising sessions available. Um, I already mentioned I already mentioned Revolution Inclusive. Um, there are other organizations such as the Canadian um, the Canadian organization Divergent, which focuses not only on masculine and feminine, but also ways that to use non-binary language, which I think is is incredibly important, um, particularly in languages that are so heavily gendered that in some cases, basically, people feel like they can't exist in their own identity. Uh, anecdotally, I, I do have a couple of friends who are native German speakers mm -hmm. who are non-binary, and they feel so much more confident and comfortable expressing themselves in English because they feel like um, in German they don't have they don't have the tools mm. to or rather they do the LGBT community as you know is, is so inventive with our language and uh, um, and there are so many tools that we can find by looking at, at our community mm -hmm. and so non-binary people of course they know how to express themselves in their own language but it's it, it's having that be recognized by by everyone mm -hmm. um that's that is the difficulty but i think that that could be extremely beneficial not just for non-binary um people but also for the more general community i think i think that the idea of uh, gender neutral language is it might be a bit of a pipe dream, but I think that the benefits would be um, would be very notable. Um, for example, I know of a school in in Sweden that only uses a gender neutral pronoun for all of the for all of the pupils, and hmm. um, that there's there's no sort of idea of gender roles, uh, and that they found that the it really limits the, the the sense of there not being the same opportunities available to to the pupils based on their gender. That it's um, and that the subjects that the pupils choose doesn't uh, isn't immediately obvious based on their gender. If that makes mm. sense, like it's not like the um, it's not like boys are more likely to want to do sports and mm -hmm. whatever. So I think. Um, in an ideal world, wouldn't it be wonderful if that could be, if the power of language was such that that we that we no longer had to um, concern ourselves with with the concept of, of gender roles and uh, and what we should or shouldn't do. I know that this doesn't just come from language, but because as a linguist, for me, it's a, it's a good place to start. Mm hmm. Because it's everywhere, all the time. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So yes, it's very nice to hear you talking about it because it's a subject that concerns me, obviously, and I've um, especially this month that it's June is important for the LGBT. I won't say the less the rest of the letters because I don't even know them. I always <laughs> get to a place and say plus because like it's hard to keep up. We all know that. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so I've I've spoken to another couple of people who have also um, talked about the subject, and so it's something that concerns me in the sense that I think people need to know that it's out there uh, being discussed, in, in that there are alternatives, options, and all of that. So, what can we expect from you in the future? It's like a deep question. Where will you be yes. in five years? Like in job interviews? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> now, Absolutely. while you do um, your your research and you do yes. your work, so what's what's going to be going on the next couple of years? Yes, so I will be continuing my research, um, of course. Um, still very passionate about my interpreting career, so I will be continuing uh, with that too. I would also be fascinated in looking at different languages. Um, 
I I speak Czech too, and I feel like focusing on the idea of inclusive language in Czech could be extremely interesting because um, the, the gender is omnipresent in, in Czech and other Slavic languages. Not only do they have three genders, but mm. um, but also, like for example, the, the past participle is always dictated by the gender of the person who's speaking, uh, conditional forms, etc. adjectives. It's omnipresent. So I think it would be extremely interesting to um, to look at Slavic languages too, mm-hmm. um, because most of my focus has been uh, in Romance languages. Um, and yes, that's that's basically my, my, my life for the next What's couple the of years. What's the story with Czech? Now I'm curious. You have to tell me a little bit about it. Why 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 that? Why Czech? <laughs> why Czech? Um, <laughs> Uh, my, my I have friends who speak Romanian, like British people who 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 speak Romanian and all that. I'm like my my friend uh, Kirsty Wolf. She speaks Romanian, and I've heard that she's really really good at it. And I'm like, why? So I have to have this these conversations with people because it's just fascinating to me that you decide as as an adult to 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 learn something. Maybe there is an emotional reason yeah. why, or sometimes it's just for professional reasons, or because you enjoy learning languages like Christy, which is like amazing to me. <laughs> Maybe maybe a combination of of all three, but, um, okay. <laughs> but more mostly mostly for love because my partner is from the Czech Republic. So, no, oh, uh, I thought I thought we had a, a French person here, but I guess not. <laughs> no, no, she's just uh, just very passionate about French inclusive language um, mm. because we we studied uh, French together at university. Ah, so the, the French was the, the language of love for you, right? I, I guess for you, you could both. say that. <laughs> Yeah, I guess you could say that. <laughs> for me, French is just exists because of terminology and, and technical things, not for my my passions. I have to say, it's like I, I like it from a, from a technical point of view. I love the grammar. I love how they mm. deal with things. I love all of that. I love their dictionaries, just the best. Um, mm-hmm. Because I, I love lexicography, so of course I have to have the the French uh, reference, and I absolutely adore it from that point of view. But I I I would say it's my quiet language, as I. <laughs> As I call it quiet language. I love speaking everything else, but French is a whole other story because I've studied more than any other language, believe it or not. But mm-hmm. then just uh, circumstances always led me towards the English speaking world. My mm-hmm. brother is exactly the opposite. So we both of us always very focused on English. But then when he was, I don't know, 12 or 15 or something, he just totally fell in love in French with French. And ever since he's been living in uh, French speaking countries and only working always for French companies, always. <laughs> <laughs> so that's funny. So that's what he does. So he absolutely, like, he's almost a, a native speaker. So I, I understand that people fall in love with it. Obviously, it's very popular for its uh, sex appeal, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that's not really. I can listen to music. I love their their movies. I, I love the technical parts of it, grammar, all of that stuff. Love using it for terminology. I mean, it, it gives you a lot of clues. Uh, and also the materials in linguistics, you know, like early, obviously, early linguistics. Uh, it's also very, very good. And especially me focusing on lexicology and lexicography and terminology, like my three loves. And so for me, French is very relevant from that point of view. But I have to say that I don't know the what I call the real life or the commercial life in, this, in the social life of French. Mm-hmm. That's something that is a bit unknown to me. So it's mm-hmm. always interesting for, for people to talk a little bit about it because it's my quiet language. It's the only thing, the only moment when I'm quiet. Is that if I'm thinking in French, then I'm totally quiet. <laughs> no one would want to hear it. <laughs> I love that idea of a quiet language. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's the one. That's the one. It's here, but it doesn't speak. <laughs> I don't speak. Uh, because I've, ne- I've never done it. I never have to do it. And so I, I don't do it. But sometimes I'm like, ah, maybe I should just make an effort and make it a more present thing in my existence. But so far, it hasn't happened. So I, I feel very comfortable with my Spanish and my English and all of that. And I speak very fast and blah, blah, blah. I say whatever I want, which is fantastic. But then for French, it's a, it's a whole other story. I would have to probably think think deeper, you know, mm-hmm. and harder. And so you never know what the future holds, but I don't think so. It's the same with learning German. Mm-hmm. You never know. <laughs> Kirsty is always encouraging me. I don't know if you know who she is. I'm talking about her, but <laughs> yes, yeah, I, I, I see, I, I see her content a lot on LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, now we're doing our networking together and things like that. Mm-hmm. So, any other messages that you would like to 
talk to us about? I think my, my final message, as I touched on before, is basically that language isn't fixed. It's not something that belongs to anybody. Um, it belongs to everybody. What mm -hmm. I mean to say is it's up to us to decide how we use it and that we shouldn't be told that the way we use it is, is wrong. Um, I, I, I'm not, I'm not a huge believer in linguistic puritanism by any means. <laughs> and I would say to people that, especially people like me who are um, language learners who might feel like that we're somehow breaking rules by wanting to be more inclusive, for example, for not wanting to be seen as, as making mistakes, mm -hmm. just go for it. Um, just go for it. And, um, and maybe with time, um, maybe with time things will change. Let's just, uh, like give it a go. D don't be scared. <laughs> <laughs> Let's all try a few techniques and see yeah. how it goes and then report your results. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for this, Beth. It's been great to talk to you. And of course, a lot of information about this subject. So I guess it's very important and very relevant uh, that people get to know you and your perspective and how this is now having an impact and the presence in the communities and social media and everything else that we do in shows and events and uh, conferences and everything else. So I guess... Uh, it was really important that you were, you went a little bit deeper than usual into the subject. And I thank you for that. Thank you very much for having me, Rita. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Hope to speak Bye. to you again. Bye. Yeah, for sure. I'm sure we will. <laughs> Bye.